Did he just ask if he could pump you? Oh my god. What? Poke. 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 Um, baby girl, eight at six thirty. So you should be alright for that. Just taking this to the side. Hold on. I mean, on. if he pumps you, he pumps you. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's true. We're married. We're wed. <laughs> oh my god. John, oh, we don't have your audio, though. I can tell that you just cursed me out, though. All right, 8.44 p.m., Charleston, ooh, South ooh. Carolina, Joey Svensson. Where you at, Natalie? Where you at? I'm in T-Town, Tampa, Florida. T- what What does T-Town mean? T-Town stands for Tampa, Florida. Then why'd you say T-Town, Tampa, Florida? <laughs> Oh, it's, you know, 813, baby. <laughs> T-Town. You know how it is, man. <laughs> 813, so close to 843 to Chuck. No, I'm saying. John, you're you're in what we call over in these parts, Mount Perfect. Does that? Or or Mount Plastic, I've Mount heard. Mount Plastic. <laughs> that one. Love that, that one. That too. There's, it's accurate. Yeah, well, I mean, there's definitely parts of Mount Pleasant that remind you of the Truman Show, for sure. It's it's. I think I for real for real though. Daniel Island is like that's true. Um, Stepford Wives. It's I never made it creepy. out there. That's yeah, true. Don't. That's true. Not great. Yep. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, I never made it out there. Well, guys, I wanted to talk about a question that I put out on the Pastor with No Answers discussion page, and I should have pulled up what that website is so I could just oh, it's facebook.com slash pwna talk, and something that. Oh, man, it's just so interesting for me because of like a lot of my fundamental tendencies that I cannot shake and never will be able to fully shake, I don't think. But the question was, when a friend or family member of yours leaves the Christian faith, how do you feel and why? So let me tell our listeners the results of that, and then I want to get y'all's take on this. So sad disappointed but not scared for their soul by far 61 percent of everyone that responded said that the second place was 17 percent scared for their soul and then the third one is the last double digit percent happy they are being true to themselves and then seven percent were unaffected three percent causes me to personally question my own faith John, John O'Hearn, if you did not answer this, how would you answer it? I did answer it. All right. Because I love the Pastor With No Answers group. Everyone should go and join it. Um, People are so pleasant there. I said. They might as well call it Pleasant. (laughs) I'm saying. Pleasantville. That's awesome. Uh, So I'm, I'm happy for. So it's changed, right? Today. I'm happy for people when they found what makes, what brings them happiness and peace, like in whatever flavor that comes from. And that's because I'm like, I've really found myself in like a true universalist camp. Yeah. And so I'm not at all worried for their soul or any of that, any of those things. Yeah. Right. Um, now that hasn't always been the case. Right. When I, when I, believed in fire and damnation, fire and damnation, hell, I, I did worry for folks soul. Um, but today I don't. And what's so interesting to me, like when you pose that question in the group, my thinking was I'm more likely probably like other people are worried about me than I'm worried (laughs) about other people. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Like, I, I don't know how many of our listeners would like consider me a Christian or not. You know, I think that I do. But I'm not sure, like, what other people might be praying for my eternal soul. Sure, sure. And and I like that you said that because I am – I actually love the fact that our listenership is – I mean, it – you can't get any more diverse because you've got people that would fall in line with how you just described yourself. And then there's, like, straight-up Calvinists listen to this podcast. I have no idea why the hell they're tuning into this podcast. <laughs> there were so many people, so many people that said, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to 
put a stab into some Calvinists right here. You guys are despicable people. Listen to this. He's sovereign, so I'm fine. <laughs> was was like uh, uh, I don't think it, I don't think anybody put that into those exact words, but basically you read between the line, and it's just a Calvinist sipping on some wine, watching Netflix, being God's sovereign. I'm fine, man. Don't matter. Burn, baby, burn. <laughs> yeah. I actually have I actually have read a theological book from a Calvinist that basically said that people's torturing forever will be to the glory of God forever and ever and ever. And I just thought that's the yikes. most disgusting thing I've ever heard in my life. Big yikes. Yeah. Natalie, what about you? Um, I don't, um, people are gray. I have a lot of feelings about the situation. I am very much in the camp that John is in, in that when I was younger, I had very concrete ideas about what it was for a person not to have faith. And, um, my uh, dad never went to church with us, and I had, like, nightmares forever that he was going to burn in hell, and that was, like, just super unhealthy. But a genuine thing that people felt, and I myself felt, and now as an adult, um, with very different theology, <laughs> um, I think, I mean, just at a base level, it's important for people to, like, be true to who they are, right? So, like, if someone is super uncomfortable and doesn't believe anymore, it's important that they come to terms with that and, like, grow from that, and that's fine. Um, I just, but you, you would admit that I, the only way you can take that posture is if you have doubts about hell and lean maybe more towards universalism. Like you disagree, disagree. That's I, so interesting. I disagree. Um, because I, well, so here's the thing is like, who cares I about people's earthly happiness? Who cares? Well, so here, but here's the thing though, <laughs> is like, I believe in a hell, but to me, like, hell is not like fire and brimstone hell to me it's like the separation from god right which in turn is like nothing happy it's like if a dementor ran the place and everything was just sad all the time that to me is hell and there's no like rescue so you believe that's eternal no rescue there it's done i believe that's the thing but i'm also like i don't know i don't i'm just trying my best oh, no, no, no. um <laughs> but when i think of like I don't know, God and, like, salvation, I think that it's important to, like, ultimately know that we don't know anything. Yeah. And, like, find a kind of comfort in that. Like, to me, that would be the worst is if, like, it was, like, Sheol, like, complete separation from anything good and God would be a hell to me, whether or not that's our reality. I don't know. All I can do is, like, hope that everyone should they choose to pursue like a relationship with god which i ultimately hope that they do because i've found a lot of peace in that um that they find their peace but like god knows them and he knows their heart and he knows why they're choosing to go the way they're choosing and like i have no hand in that all i can do is hope that they know who they are oh my gosh i wish i wish I could have had that posture my whole life and i i don't i really don't know if i have the capacity to believe in hell even the sort because i totally if there's a hell i don't believe that it's people burning in flames forever but any belief in a in a hell where people are separated from god forever it's mm -hmm. hard for me to have peace in a way of saying there's nothing that i can do god's obviously gonna do what god's gonna do and i almost envy people that are able to do that like and so i would even go so far as to say i completely understand people's suspicions of me when they say joey is leaning more towards annihilationism or universalism because he can't deal with living with a belief of anything else and maybe yeah. maybe they're right but honestly like i think if people People won't listen to people that uh, that believe in universalism, Christians that believe in universalism, or read their stuff because they've already already written it off as heresy. But I, I'm, oh, I'm going to sure. go so far as to say I do not think universalism is a pie in the sky belief. And I, I actually I actually think that if someone presents their argument for hell, one can present an argument for universalism that is equally, if not more, supported by the Bible. And my Lord more in line with God's character that we would think of that's, God being love. That's the thing is like, you look at how God is, especially like when you're reading the new Testament and you look at like how, he, how Jesus is with people and how he chooses to have conversations with people. And like, 
there's so much love and so much forgiveness and so much understanding and grace. And I think that's the biggest thing is it took so long for me to like come to terms with the idea of God's grace and that I will never understand it in my human capacity. And because of that, that gives me a semblance of peace because I know that at the end of the day, like God is bigger than anything that I could even imagine. And it's in, the balls in his court. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So I, I put, or, or I think that uh, sad, disappointed, but not scared for their soul. But I would have to put an asterisk and say, part of me is lying <laughs> because I, I, I don't think I can ever completely shake somewhat of a fear of hell. Like I, I, I mean, I, it, it's like 40 year damage, man. I mean, I, I just don't know if that's something I can com- because bottom line is my whole paradigm, I, how I, the lenses that I look through is based on my upbringing of decades of a belief in hell. And so it's just like something that I don't think can, can ever go away. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but if I was a betting person, I do lean more towards universalism. It's interesting too, Nat, what you said, because I do think that when Jesus interacted with people personally, it's like, Whoa, that dude's loving. If that's how God is, then we're all in good hands. But when he like taught the crowds, he said some pretty heavy, denouncing, condemning stuff. In fact, I am I, I had a conversation with um, Brian McLaren. Some people know him, uh, an author, and he's going to come on here and address a lot of those really crazy, mean, violent sort of things that Jesus said. And he actually has an explanation for every single one of them, which is, is super interesting. But, I mean, have you guys ever just, like, recently just grazed through the Gospels and read just how— I mean, Jesus almost, when he was talking to the crowds, it almost came across bullying. I mean, just like, woe to you, and it will be more bearable for this city than for that city, and the goats will be separated from the sheep, and they will be sent to eternal torment. I mean, it's just like, golly. It was it was kind of a rude awakening, honestly, when I, when I read all of that. And so actually hearing McLaren's perspective was, was pretty helpful. But then when you see Jesus in like one-on-one, you're like, okay, we're we're all good, but I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I'm doing the Bible thing where, like, you're trying to read the Bible throughout the year. Um, so I will for sure get there. Um, but I genuinely have a... I don't know. I think everyone has kind of, like, a bias of what they choose to remember if they haven't read it recently. So I'll for, yeah, sure, for sure let you know when I get there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. So, John... Oh, God, it looks like you're about to say something. I was about to ask you something. Oh, no. I was just going to say, like, so I, I, um, I haven't read them the gospels recently either, although it has come to like the top of my attention, um, that like those are next in my spiritual readings of like going back through probably just the gospels. But what's hard for me to shake is like, um, this God that, that is painted as vengeful and, or justice. What some would say is justice, right? You, you don't, um, get clean or, or sanctified. And so you have to go to hell. That's just, that's justice. Um, I can't like write that with the God of, uh, my experience, which has just been 100% grace and mercy and like abundance and like all of these. Um, and I'm not just saying like monetary things, but like uh, emotional and spiritual abundance in the face of me doing horrible, heinous, like debauchery, you know? And so, um, for me, I've always latched on to, and maybe I am just forgetting, but I've always latched on to, to Jesus being love and compassion because that's what I've experienced. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and I, I was just listening to a podcast recently of people that minimize experience. And I'm like, I, I'm not so sure if everybody was honest. They have to admit that, I, I mean, I think experience maybe you don't realize it or not, but it seems like that's what we're all going like. That's what we're all going by. I I mean, Mm. but maybe not. I mean, maybe there's some people that don't feel anything and they, and they read stuff and they're okay. That's what I'm going by. Cause that's, that's what the Bible says. But yeah, I'm totally like, I just, I mean, I I'm at the point now to where when, when (laughs) it's funny, I was talking to uh, Jed about, Nephilim and all that stuff and (laughs) when God commands the slaughter of women children 
men and, and Canaan. To me, it's either the Jews didn't hear correctly. God did not tell them to do that. Or they were demonically Nephilim, like just despicable, horrible, child sacrificing. They need to be blocked, you know, just taken out of the world. I mean, but I, I don't know. I just, mm-hmm. it just to me does not make any sense. And, and what's tough too is raising kids in a time and where I just don't know what I think about so much stuff. But I, but I have thought the more my kids see God as loving and unconditionally gracious, the more likely they're going to keep returning to a God that I feel is worth returning to. You know, I was talking, my, my, yep. my, my kids know that I'm pretty doubtful of hell. And I forgot the analogy that I said to my sons, but I was just like, okay, how would you guys feel if Waylon, you were really good at listening to me for a few weeks and William, you did your mm-hmm. own thing. You were like, screw what dad says. I'm going to do my own thing. And so next month, I basically told Waylon that I was going to take him on an unbelievable trip. We're going to be in a cabin right on the lake, and we're going to fish together. We're going to eat whatever we want to eat, watch what we want to watch. And William, because of what you did the last few weeks, I'm going to uh, lock you up in a tiny little shack and not feed you anything you're almost going to starve it's going to be baking summer in charleston so you're going to be hot and and just basically i'm going to torture you because you didn't do what i said i mean and when people take the when people hear me say that and they're they're so emotional filled and all that i'm like yeah but i don't then it's like they want to have their cake and eat it too because they'll also say just think of how sad god was and what a sacrifice it was to send his son it's like you want me to try to relate to what you just said but then when i try to relate eternal damnation to a concrete place in my life i'm I'm not allowed to do that like i just don't see how people are fine with a god that creates humanity knowing that we we mm-hmm. we're not omniscient. We don't know everything. We can't figure it out. I mean, there's so many people that I've heard that turn their back on faith because they didn't feel God anymore. And and sure, I can hear I know exactly what Christians mm-hmm. would say about that and I understand where they're coming from, but God knows that he is so much more knowing than us and it just doesn't make sense for him to be like, "All right, you didn't figure it out. You're separated from me forever. I created you lovingly, but thing. you're separated because you didn't figure things out." There's a weird like dissonance there where I feel like if God is all loving and all knowing, he could not in good conscience not even consider someone who didn't know any better, who genuinely mm-hmm. didn't know any better. Right. Right. I think what's also, I don't know, something that stood out to me, especially when like thinking about your kids and stuff, because I've been, th- <laughs> I've like kind of had anxiety uh, with regards to like, you know, little things with Artie. Um, one of which is like, hey, she's going to be going to church with us. What if one day she just wakes up and says, I don't want to go anymore? Right. You know, um, I think it's important to give her that space and to let her kind of discover that, but like have that conversation. Because when I was younger, I never had that opportunity. And I feel like it did more harm than good. Um, And I think it's also important to like know that as a parent, like we need to show our kids that we are not perfect. It is so pivotal that we show our kids that we are not perfect and that we do not know everything and that we are trying. So they know that when they see it themselves trying and they don't get it, that that's normal. You know, because so many times older people in my life who have been like these pinnacles of faith seem like they're like so strong in their faith, which isn't bad. Like it's a beautiful thing to have faith and be strong in it. But like, the idea of someone never having a doubt and you having all of them is for sure ostracizing and can be really difficult to deal with if you feel like you can't trust or have a conversation with a person who probably should be listening in on what you're thinking because you feel like they're going to judge you because they've never had to struggle like that. Yeah. Yeah. 
I find it hard to believe that those people exist, that there are actually people that haven't struggled with their faith and they're just like putting on this show or this act. And maybe I'm totally wrong. Right. But like if if anybody is any semblance of me, they're going to have to like walk through something like set right. some sort of questioning or, or change their mind or, around something sometime ever. So like people that, that do that, <laughs> um, I don't trust them, <laughs> frankly. Yeah, and like, and I just don't get and And maybe I'm wrong and I just don't get it. Right. But um, it's an interesting thing. One other thing I did want to just mention that like for sure, if we're talking about potential heresy, like people speaking potential heresy, just hold on to your socks. I don't think <laughs> that I... I'm not willing to follow or worship a God that is going to cut people off and is extinguish them or burn them in hell forever. Um, and so like, and I've had this conversation with multiple people, like a lot of like, well, what if that's God's God and, and that's how it is and that's okay with some folks. And like, they're, they're going to be either cut off or extinguished forever or burn in hell, whatever. And that's God's decision. I can't question those motives or like what makes God tick. And, and I understand that perspective at the same time, like, okay, cool. Well, I don't know if I'm willing to follow a God that's going to do yeah. that to the, I mean, the creations that he made. That's a great point. And yeah. I would say I will, because I'd be scared not to. And, and it, Ooh, I don't like that. I, I know at you all. don't like it. I know John <laughs> doesn't either, but I, if, <laughs> If I truly believed, okay, God is going to send people to hell, they're going to burn forever, you know, people that were born and raised in India and never were introduced to the gospel or any of that stuff, I'd be like, that really sucks. I don't like it. I don't understand it. If there's not more to the story, that makes me angry, but I'm going to follow God because I don't want to burn in hell forever. I mean, I don't know. I I don't know what else I I would do. I mean, if... (laughs) I feel like (laughs) grace, man, like grace is so big and God's grace is so like insane. There has to be an answer for that. I'd probably never know it, you know, but the idea of like someone like that or people, just people, people as a whole, I'm not, here's the problem is like I teeter and people sometimes call me universalist because this is like my comfort and my peace is knowing that God's grace is big enough to cover most anything because it's God. Um, but can, can I stop you right there? Argue can it? I stop you right there? Yeah. If God grace cov- if God's grace covers all, then mm-hmm. how how can you how can you believe in hell? And that's not me criticizing your beliefs because I respect your beliefs like a lot. Mm-hmm. But it's to me, it's just like so. Grace is extended a hundred percent to some people, but then not a hundred percent to other people Here's because the, like. But I I think. I think here's the thing, though, is, like, I don't know. The only reason that I think what I do with regards to hell is because I did a lot of research (laughs) when I was in school um, with regards to, like, medieval and ancient thoughts of hell. Um, And I read a lot about Sheol. And, like, that's, like, the Jewish idea of hell and that it's their hell is not really hell but just separation from God as opposed to, like, what became better understood as the evangelical version of hell, which is like the Renaissance idea of hell, that like people burn and that's a whole thing. Um, And I just jived with the earlier one because it made more sense to me. Um, However, I have no idea. Like, it's just that it's, I'm very much of the vein that like, I grew up like thinking that there was a hell being told that there was a hell. And fearing for, like, everyone I knew who didn't go to church or believe that they were going to go to hell. And that's such an awful way to just maneuver through life because it's exhausting. Oh, yeah. You, you have and to kind of put it, you have to put it in your subconscious. It can't be It's on exhausting. Your yeah. And, like, I, I don't know, man. I came to a place, and it took me years to get here, the idea, like, of trying to find peace with grace. And maybe it doesn't jive with my idea of hell or that i think there might even be a semblance of it but i'm not at that point where i'm comfortable saying i'm a universalist because yeah. i don't not just not there yeah, totally totally <laughs> I, I, i'm a i'm a doubtful and hopeful universalist i think i would say but john let's try let's I try to bring that. natalie to the dark side let me let me let me throw this to you. <laughs> natalie, if, uh, natalie so there is not one human being and obviously there's an exception to this but i think to the the depths of our soul there's not one person who would say 
that you should physically torture your child if they don't obey you. Like if, if we read on the news or see somewhere that that's happening, that a parent was upset with their child or the, or the child decided not to obey their parent and they were tortured or just cut from the family line, cut out of the inheritance. You didn't do what I said. Mm. You, you're, you're out. None of us would be like, mm. okay, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. That's, you know, we'd all be like, man, that is a pretty despicable parent. Well, we are made, <laughs> we're made in God's image. So it seems yeah. like that, like when I think of God's image, I think of something that's pretty consistent amongst humanity. And it's like all of us would feel comfortable with treating one of our kids better than the other according to how they responded to us. Like I've got, I've got four kids. Some of them listen better than others. Some of them are probably going to disappoint us more than others with decisions that they make in the future and all of that. And I'm love going that. to <laughs> yeah. love them equally. Like I'm, I'm and yeah, so I don't know. And, and I'm, I, I'm pro honestly, I'm saying all this, but I'm, I'm probably pretty close to where you're at, except I lean more towards universalism than I do separation. And I do feel Chris, Chris date of rethinking hell podcast has definitely brought me more to, if there's a hell it's annihilationism, like people are destroyed forever. And I can almost, I can live with that. Honestly, like if God says, you know what, there's just something in, in the earth where if you put belief in me, you live forever. But if you don't, you don't live forever. Uh, you know, huh. I can, I can, I can actually see that. What a novel thought. Yeah. Like, so, oh, well, think, think, of it, think of it this way. John three sixteen, for whoever believes in me will have eternal life. Okay. So if you believe in God, you live forever. If you don't believe in God, you actually do die and you're gone forever. So I can, I can huh. actually see that. I can be on board with that. Joey, you're messing me up, man. I'm going to have to like, re- <laughs> I'm going to be in a weird place when this is all over. <laughs> Is that a bad thing or a good thing? Nah, it's good, man. Like being uncomfortable leads to growth and that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been, uh, have you encountered annihilationist teachings, John? Like, do you have any thoughts on that? And, and yeah, and I will I've say listened that it's a, to Chris Dade's podcast. Yeah. It's a little more barbaric than people die and they're gone. Like they actually, according to yeah. annihilationists, they're actually thrown into a fire and destroyed forever. I haven't heard that piece. I understood it is they it was when you die it's over. That's a like, you know, it's yeah. a wrap sort of thing. And mm-hmm. um and it, I felt like that was a step like a stepping stone to universalism for me. Yeah. Like okay, I can like come off of this idea of like hell, like separation f- for eternity and or you know, fire, damnation and and torment and all of that stuff. Here's a stepping stone of okay, God isn't a vengeful child let's move us to like okay you just get extinguished right like the light is just turned off or out and then for me like the just it was a, a progression to universalism sure but sure. yeah I've, I've um i've heard that along the way but and here's another here's another tricky thing that i don't think we talk about enough and it's just something that we've all accepted and i just want to say what what in the hell are we thinking? And it's this whole once we die, that's when God gives up on us. So here we are on the earth. We've got and we're completely fair game with putting our faith in him. And he's going to pursue us while we are mortally alive. But then when we pass into immortality, that's when we're cut off from having any option. Like it's like what what kind of stupid like. <laughs> Why in the world would that be the thing that discounts us from being able to make a decision? Our mortal bodies get, that last for like point zero 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 one percent of our existence, and that is the litmus test of no. Or I don't know if that's the right word that I want to use, but that's when God says, "Okay, no more, no more choice. Your mortal body, your have mortal you s- body is dead, so you don't have a choice now." That's crazy. Have you have you seen the Good Place? Because that's this. The Good Place <laughs> was that a movie? Yeah. No, it's a show. So it's a show. I think it's on NBC. Um, and the premise of the show is... Okay, spoilers to whoever. Um, but the premise of the show <laughs> is essentially um, you have this, like, you have these people who are dead and they're told they made it to the good place. And they're in the good place and then 
chaos ensues and they realize that they're actually in the bad place but the good place like they like faked this good place that's actually like made to give them anxiety and like play off their fears or whatever and then it's actually hell and it's like this new rebooted version of hell um but then they're frustrated because they're like what the heck like i know i wasn't a great person um but I mean, I wasn't the worst. Like, I wasn't Hitler. Like, there's got to be, like, a medium place right. where I can go live because that's crazy. And so it's honestly, it's a great lesson and a great, like, exercise in moral philosophy. Weirdly enough, the show is um, because it beckons that question. Like, if we die and we're just judged on our lives on Earth, like, that's not really the best. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't we have another chance? Wouldn't we have another chance after we know? And it's like... Is that the whole point of us living that, you know, to test how we are without knowing? Exactly. And, and it's it's a, it feels this... like a big test in our problem solving skills. Like, can you right. figure out this riddle without knowing all yes. of the answers? And then we're going to give you the answer and tell you if you're right or wrong after you die. But and like, you're right. stuck with it if, forever. But then it's too late. But like, if you know, if you know the answer, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. like if you, if you knew for a fact that heaven existed and that, burn me hell existed then that would for sure like take over your entire life and you would live your life to the t to ensure that you got up to that top and that's not really the point either at least not the point of living right the like that's no there's not it's not faith if you know for a fact that this is the way that it's going to play out that's not faith yeah right yeah yeah but sure and I would, and also, I would say too, it's like really in line with understand. For, so for me and my worldview, it does like all of those little rules and making it to the good place. Let's say, d- don't matter because we're all going. And it's it's more about relationship with God and relationships with those around you, and and being a conduit of love and peace and joy and like all the things that God is to those people around us. Right. So like that's rad. So, um, so the guesswork just doesn't make a shit to me, you know, it's like, uh, okay. Um, I I don't feel the need to jump through all of the philosophical and moral, uh, gymnastic hoops anymore. It's, you know, does that make sense? Beautiful, man. And, and, And how I feel is I am sick and tired of feeling guilty for asking sincere questions and, and verbalizing them. Like, I, I'm like, I'm sorry. I, I just, I've had enough of feeling bad about being out of line or being a heretic or, I mean, and, and one more, you know, we can wrap this up, but one more thought that I had too was I used to always hear the verse, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And I used to think, okay, those that do that on earth, we're good to go. Cause when we die, we'll do it voluntarily and we'll mm. be led into heaven. But the people that don't do it on earth, they're going to do it almost involuntarily slash voluntarily but they're seeing god and all of his love and i mean basically oh my gosh you are god and i'm so sorry and now i see that you're so loving and i want more than anything to have you and god's going to be like sorry you're not on earth anymore and so i can't accept that (laughs) and oh yeah by the way you're seeing me in my totality to where you can Mm. make that decision you didn't have that on earth but yeah Mm. I mean, it's just, I just, oh my gosh. I, so I, I feel like it's okay for us to be like, wait a second, that sort of God that we were taught, it just, it just doesn't make sense. And I, and I, I, I love these conversations too, because I know that my brother is editing it, all of it and he's way more conservative I'm than me. And apart. he's just like, what the yeah. hell, Joey? <laughs> Come on, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, Joey here. Before we go to the Trump report card portion of our show, wanted to welcome Paul Edgar to our Patreon community. Thank you for joining us, my friend. And you guys can go there at patreon.com forward slash PWNA pod to see what that's all about. I've recently started little Monday through Friday video reflections that has been starting some conversation here and there and got a little marco polo group and just some other things coming ahead but really do appreciate everyone's support on there and also upcoming we're going to be kicking back some old school pastor with no answer type shows that are a little bit more in the debate debate forum 
We've got an atheist that will be debating our residential guest, Jack Hoy, on the existence of God. We've got a debate on whether or not demons and Satan are allegorical or real. We also have a discussion coming up, a little debate on whether or not you can hear from God and know that your faith is valid. Soon, we also will be releasing an interview with Jay Givens, formerly of Humble Beast. He's a hip-hop artist that recently came out of the closet and has obviously sparked a whole lot of conversation in the Christian community, considering that he is a Christian. So, lots of things coming up. Thank you guys for your support and for listening. If you've got a second... Go to iTunes, leave a rating, and maybe even say some kind things about this podcast. But without further ado, here's Jack Hoy and my discussion with him about the Donald Trump presidency. Peace, peace. All right, back on the spin zone. Uh, familiar voice, Jack Hoy, the greater. And um, Jack, thanks for being willing to come on here and talk about uh, the hot item of Donald Trump. But I, I want to make a confession to you, and I want you to be totally honest. You're not going to hurt my feelings. But I, I truly know very little about the current state of, of politics. I couldn't really tell you a lot of the hot issues. I mean, I, I think, you know, if you ask me what were the most troublesome countries, I think North Korea, I think maybe China is, uh, you know, I, I just, I don't really know a lot. Like over, I would say over the last 10 years, I just, I just became disinterested. Um, I think the, I mean, honestly, when I would watch a, a debate, presidential debate which i i still will watch for entertainment but i seriously i don't consider myself a super smart educated informed person going into something like that so i literally will see two candidates basically say you're lying i'm telling the truth and i don't know who's telling the truth like i really mm. don't so i just become jaded and um like i i couldn't I mean, I could make some pretty educated guesses of what 2020, what the hot issues would be. I just, I don't know, and I kind of don't care. But I'll, I'll say part of why I kind of don't care is I know that there are people that are super smart that do care. <laughs> and, and, and maybe a lot of those people will have, you know, influence. But be honest, you, you probably hear that and you're like, eh, that's kind of irresponsible. No, I don't think so. I mean, I just think not not everybody's oriented towards thinking through issues like that. I mean, I you know, one of the things that is actually, I would say, historically been one of the great things about America is that most people don't care that much about politics because politics really hasn't been that important. You know, you live your life, you do your, you go to work and you do your job well, and that's a big part of how you serve people. You, if you have a family, you you know, you raise your family. And, 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 and those are the most important things that you do. You know, yeah. you participate in the church or maybe other community involvements. And, um, you know, how you think about politics is really pretty insignificant in terms of the contribution that your life makes to the greater good. Yeah. So, no, I don't think it's irresponsible at all. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I, I've told you this before, but I think uh, our listeners would get a kick out of this that – and I think it was I think it was the 2016 election because I lack knowledge in a lot of different things. There were some times where instead of like I didn't want to vote the straight Republican ticket or the straight Democratic uh, ticket, so there were some times when I wrote your name in. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! I, so well, I won Joey, I never won any of those elections. <laughs> Nobody ever came back and said, "Hey, surprise." <laughs> Did, did I hear correctly? I don't know if Pastor Greg said this or Josh or, or someone in the Seacoast world said, and, and this is when I had first gotten to know you. Like, I, I think I had just met you and someone said, yeah, he's a super smart guy. Did you ever have like a written plan of how to get America out of debt? Like, did you ever think that through that well, it thoroughly? Wasn't, actually, it wasn't. It, it was a, I had a... Uh, argument 
for how America should achieve energy independence. Okay. So this was back. So this was before fracking. And um, it's interesting how things have panned out in that regard. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a, it didn't have a comprehensive, here's what America needs to do. No. Yeah. But it was definitely something you just thought you would think through. Yeah. Well, it was, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't remember what the context was, but yeah. Um, I like thinking about things like yeah. that. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I want to start here with Trump. If, how do you think Trump would be seen in the public eye if he carried himself with good manners and public class and I'll throw Ronald Reagan and JFK out there. So let's so so Trump's not saying crazy things on Twitter. You know, when people ask ab about, you know, what do you think about Donald Trump? Most people would say, you know what? You know, I don't agree with all of his policies, but I respect how he carries himself. Like if he was that sort of person that knew how to carry himself and in, in, in a light where everybody just kind of liked him, would we see him differently in general as a as a president? Well, I think we would. And I think he would be a lock for reelection. Yeah. Now, I don't I, I wouldn't put him in the. Reagan class if, if he was just if he would just shut up right yeah. if he was a dignified person who didn't just puke his emotions all over the place and you know blah 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 um, because there's some actually some good things that have happened in his administration um, you know I I think that the the economic stewardship of the first year year and a half the tax bill if you're going to do a tax cut, that was the tax cut to do, I think. Yeah. Um, even more important, you know, I, I don't, didn't feel like the economy needed a tax cut so much as they needed to lighten the regulatory hand, and they've done that. And um, and that, that, I think, has had the biggest positive impact in the economy. So now, you know, his foreign policy has been kind of hit and miss, but again, because it reflects his chaotic, undisciplined style. He's not... Yeah. So anyway, I I think yes, he would certainly be perceived as better if he didn't just run his mouth and and you know tweet all the garbage that he tweets out all the time. Yeah. I mean, but, so we would see his policies in a different light. Well, the, well, the, the policies right now it's kind of like he's got some. You know, you might say he's got some good policies, but the guy himself is just so appalling. If the guy himself wasn't so appalling, then. His policies would be relatively more important in most in many people's eyes. Yeah. Now I hear some people say, you know, that well, this is exactly what we needed is someone who didn't care how he sounded, didn't care about offending people. We need someone who's not gonna play by the rules of politics. And I I think that you could probably do that and still not come across like a jerk but i will say that i i really do think that trump being president has opened the door for you know people think it's outlandish of a thought for kanye west to run for president i think it could very well happen like yes. i think trump has opened the door for people to be like well we didn't like trump but we sure like not having to play by the politic rules yeah yeah here's a guy who does you know I, I I agree with what you just said. Like it's just like the what who who's next? I mean, um, I don't know. I is there is there anything like as as an informed guy like yourself that that is interested in stuff like this? Is there anything that you're actually worried like? This something really bad could happen with Donald Trump as president. Like, is there anything specific? Well, let me let me say a couple things. Yeah. You know, first of all, you know, I probably like I don't worry about Donald Trump being a threat to democracy because everybody is up in arms against him, and it seems to me that the you know the institutions are doing what they're supposed to do. You know, a lot of what he's accused of doing never happened because he was restrained. People didn't carry out a crazy order, you know, or like what you would expect smart, responsible people to do. Right. Now, the problem is, you know, then a bunch of them get frustrated and leave or they get fired, right? I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying that Trump doesn't create issues, but I'm just saying that 
that we've got lots of shock absorbers in our system and they seem to be working. I'm not worried about Trump being a dictator because people would be, you know, people are up in arms enough as it is. He's, you know, he's barely hanging on to a decent enough fraction of support. So I don't look at him as a threat to democracy. Now, I do think he's doing a lot of damage internationally. And, you know, this is where, you know, like the fundamental thing about China and the way that they, you know, I'd say two fundamental problems, the way that they cheat and the way that they steal intellectual property specifically is a big issue. Yeah. And it needs to be addressed. And, he, you know, he's actually kind of focused on that. Um, like that, that would be a positive if it happens. But he's doing so much collateral damage and so many steps that just seem to have no rhyme or reason. And, you know, fundamentally, it's like part of your posture in the world needs to be people need to understand what it is you're saying and that you mean it when you say it. Yeah. And how in the world do you have any confidence that you know what the United States is going to do tomorrow when they're led by a guy named Donald Trump? I mean, yeah. that's that's a that's a big problem. Yeah. Now. Do you think, and and I, and I can actually, I think I can claim ignorance. I mean, I've heard some stuff, but I don't know when to believe the media and when not to believe the media. I mean, do, do did we elect a racist for a president? I mean, from from what you gather, I mean, I I guess there's no way to know for sure whether or not. Well, here's what I would say. I mean, if you want to take the argument that everybody is a racist, then yes, we did almost by definition, right? Sure. And it, certainly he says things that have a racist tinge. The sense that I have, though, is that, you know, actually, you know, he, that like race, uh, he, the guy has many faults, but racism doesn't seem to be one of them, is my perspective. Yeah. Now, that's just based on what I have read. I don't, I don't think that that's a distinguishing characteristic of Donald Trump, is racism. Now, do you, do you, uh, what's, what's your reaction? Uh, chuckle or roll your eyes in disgust but the 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 habit of evangelicals to make the republican candidate or president their christian candidate i mean it it really is insane how easy it is for someone like donald trump to just throw one line out there in regards to believing in prayer and and everybody's like I knew it. I knew he was a godly man. I mean, <laughs> it's insane. Well, anybody who would make that statement, who would think that Donald Trump was a godly man because of some of the things that have come out of his mouth, I don't understand that logic. But it's very easy for me to understand why evangelicals support him. Because he's not their enemy. And I think the Democratic Party is. Okay. Yeah, explain that. Just... So, so Beto O'Rourke. Now he's dropped out as a candidate, but you know, in the the third or fourth debate, he was asked the question of, you know, do you think that um, uh, tax deductibility of contributions should be taken away from organizations that that don't line up with, um, you know, progressive thinking on, um, uh, you know, sexual orientation, blah blah blah. blah. And his thing was absolutely, absolutely. Like, we need to destroy any opposition to our way of thinking. Like, those guys are the fascists, and they're the dangerous ones if you if democracy is important to you. That's my view. Yeah. And so Christians line up behind the guy who's not their enemy, appalling human being though he is. So here's an example. If you were a first century Christian and you're trying to, and you got a choice of voting for Tiberius or Claudius, okay, Tiberius was the guy, it was the emperor who came after Augustus. And he was one of the most appalling human beings in recorded history. I mean, he was just perverted and sick and cruel. And, but he didn't persecute the church. Claudius, there's a, there are a lot of different theories about Claudius, but he seemed to be a much better human being. But he perse persecuted the church mercilessly. If you were a Christian, which one might you vote for? All right. Pretty easy choice, huh? Yeah, well, I mean, I think so. And so I think that's where most Christians come from is— those guys hate us, and and they want to stomp, you know stomp on everything we believe, and they don't think we should even be allowed to think what we think. And this guy, he's a nut job, but he doesn't hate us. He's not after us. He's not our enemy. Yeah, I mean, I I see this honestly as like an uh, a crazy cycle because I think that some of the 
animosity or trying to shut down evangelicals. I, I think some of it is warranted, one being that there's so many Christians who would be so quick to say Donald Trump is obviously a Christian. I mean, that's a slap in the face to Christianity. That's, you know, or I think the the, the maltreatment well, of the LGBTQ community, I mean, like, just my gosh it seems like of all people christians should should be really good at loving it, yes and 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 it's it's beyond sad when we demonstrate that we're not right right yeah so i don't know i mean i i, I definitely i see what you're saying as far as you know ha- and i'm not trying to argue that that's exactly the way everybody should think i'm just saying that's why i think he right. has the support he does from the evangelical community yeah that's all yeah. That's my interpretation. Yeah. What is your thoughts on 2020? I mean, do you I think do you think it'll be one of the I mean, I it seems like I now I think there's going to be a drop off, but I like to speculate about this. I think it will be the most voted election in the history of America. It it'll either be that or the least. Yeah. I, I mean, so so Donald, you know, like the one thing I was supposed to say about, you know, like the, all the stuff people going after Trump and it's like the, and he, and everybody knew what they were getting when they voted for him. Right. You know, like none of, I, I can't imagine that any of this is a surprise. You, you would hope that he would be better than he is, but there, he gave no evidence of it beforehand. You got to say that, you know? Um, so Trump has, you know, his support and then, and then you got, you know, people in the middle and what do they do? That's the real question. And, you, you know, you see the bumper stickers about, you know, any functioning adult in 2020, kind of like the, and the Democrats seem like they're really struggling to find one of those. You know, I, I, I think Joe Biden has been running for president for 30 years. He's always been deemed not up to the job. I don't think now that he's in his late seventies that he's, yeah made progress from that. I, that's just, I, I have trouble seeing him getting the nomination. He's every time he's, he's gone after it for decades. He's been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Okay. Yep. And then, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders, I have trouble imagining that people are going to vote for a 78 year old guy. Who's just had a heart attack. Truthfully, just right. leaving aside anything else. And then Elizabeth Warren, I, you know, she has a plan for everything and her, I'm, but her, I mean, to me, a, a plan is not a delusional fantasy, and a lot of her so-called plans are just that. They're crazy. I, it's hard for me to imagine people voting for her and thinking then that she's going to do what she says she's going to do. Yeah. I, it would be enormously destructive. So who else? So you know, I think people like, like Pete Buttigieg, maybe he's, a, maybe he's a normal guy, and he seems in a lot of ways to be. His resume is pretty thin. But this is where, you know, when I heard that Mike uh, Mike Bloomberg was thinking about running for the nomination, I just thought, please, I would vote for you in a heartbeat. Yeah. I've never voted for a Democrat for president. I've abstained a couple of times because I didn't want to vote for the Republican. But but I would vote for you and I campaign for you, frankly, you know, <laughs> I, not because I agree with him on everything. But it, it, here's a very accomplished, mature adult. It would be so nice to have one of those in the White House. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, do you think that there are any unfair criticisms of Trump or misinformed or? <laughs> well, certainly people, you know, like, again, I think one of the problems that the Democratic House has is, you know, they kind of declared before he took office that he needed to be impeached. And so any excuse will do in their mind. I mean, you know, you know, the, and of course, part of the deal is it's not like the Constitution is real specific about what is impeachable and what is not, which I think is good, wise, actually. You know, you, you wouldn't want to say, well, this guy's a lunatic and he's going to blow up the, you know, the world, but, but technically he doesn't meet the criteria and so he's got to stay in office. Yeah. Um, but, but the converse of that is the Democrats, I just don't feel like they have any credibility. And, you know, the, the, like this Ukraine stuff, is this impeachable? Well, just because they say it is doesn't make it so nobody has any confidence in their you know that they're trying to be fair-minded about anything yeah and um i don't know i mean like personally i would love to see him out of office i would love to see that yeah um 
You would let but, even through impeachment. But but the Democrat. Well, see, here's the thing, though. You know, again, the country's so polarized. I don't. I, I can't imagine that 17 or 18 Republican senators are going to vote to impeach, unless there's something that nobody's seen yet. And part of it is, it's like the hey, you're just going after him because you've wanted him out from the beginning, and we're not we're not part of that program. Yeah. And and because the the, uh, the criteria for impeachment are kind of vague, I I just don't see I don't see a bridge that's going to bring sixty seven senators together. Yeah. So I don't think it's going to happen through impeachment. And frankly, I just think uh, you've got to be careful not to disenfranchise people. And that's I think you got a lot of you know the, the the people who are Trump supporters, kind of like the. Yeah, he may be a a nut job, but that's what you need to clean out yeah. the you know the mess in Washington. Yeah, and you know all you're going to do is confirm their suspicions if you turn them out of office for something that isn't broadly agreed upon as unworthy of the office of president. If it's a purely a partisan thing, you're just you know you're just making the divide worse. Yeah, and so you get your guy elected next time. You're just energizing them to come after him in the same way. You know, like we, we already have a, a government that just seems incapable of governing right now. Is there is there any stop to this polarization? I mean, do you, do you at, at some point do yes. people just say enough is enough? This is just not constructive. Like, well, the thing is, it's like you got to have somebody who's able to bring people together. Now, sadly, you know, the thing that has brought people together in the past has been a war. Yeah, 9-11. Yeah, okay. Like, you don't want that to be the thing that happens. Um, you know, but I would also say, you know, there have, been, there have been leaders who were successful in uniting, not everybody, but, you know, being broadly viewed as a, as, as, as you know, the leader of our country in a, in a way that was respected. I think that's possible again. Yeah. Um, well, so here's uh, here's my skepticism is I th- I think the second George Bush made s- a strong effort, you know, to the point where he said yes to almost everything and got us in a, a bunch more debt. But it was because he wanted to unite liberals and conservatives. It seems like he really did try. And I mean, before Trump, he was for sure the most hated Republican president of all time for some reason. Yeah. But you know, the challenge with him is he was such a poor communicator. Yeah. He could never articulate to, you know, and see like that was something Greg Reagan was great at. You know, you, when you look at, when you look at a, like a, the last landslide election was Reagan in 84. Yeah. And, um, you know, there were still a lot of people that thought that Ronald Reagan was just this dumb, ignorant conservative, but but a lot of people in the middle realized that he was a good leader. And because he was true to himself and he was able to communicate why he believed what he believed. And people thought, and people were attracted to the to that vision, even if they didn't agree with all the details. I think it's possible for somebody to do that again. But, you know, that's the thing. It's like Bill Clinton had the communication ability. Yeah. But he lacked any central principles in his life. So he had nothing to unify people towards. I think George Bush had some admirable principles, but he he wasn't a good communicator. And I would also just say, I just don't know that he was really fully up to that job. And that's not a criticism of him. I mean, not many people are. You know? Yeah. Um, is is there an easy way to answer the question of how you think things would? It, oh, let me put it this way: Would there be a very obvious difference in how Gore would have responded in nine eleven? Like I've thought before. I mean, that election was so close. What if Al Gore was the president when nine eleven happened? Like, do you think that it would have been a lot different? And, and good or bad or well that's that's a really interesting question and I, I, boy you know who knows I mean my inclination is to say no I don't think it would have been a lot different yeah and specifically in terms of the 9/11 response 
Now, how far it went, would he have invaded Afghanistan? <laughs> eh, maybe not. Yeah. But, but any president in that situation would have felt under enormous pressure, not just to talk tough, but to take meaningful action. And you had the country united around meaningful, aggressive action, you yeah. know? So I don't know. I, I tend to think it wouldn't have been, I guess my reaction is I tend to think it wouldn't have been that different. Yeah. Yeah. Any, do you think that, uh, if we could, if we could take a little trip to the future, let's say a hundred years, do you think there's a possibility that we'd be shocked with how history reflects on Trump? Or do you think, nah, we pretty much know how <laughs> history is going to reflect on Trump? I think that you never know how history will reflect on anything or anybody. Yeah. I just think that's one of the things that I've gathered from reading history is how, how reputations change. And... And at the, and I would just say it doesn't mean that history always gets it completely right either. But I would just say that's one of the reasons why good history is rarely written within the first 50 years after an event. Yeah. Because it takes time for people's for people to get distant enough emotionally that they can calmly look at the reality of what happened and who these people were. Yeah. So here's an example of me not being informed. This is probably a very dumb question. Is there any, would there be any good strategy in the Republicans not having Trump as their candidate in 2020, or would that be complete suicide? <laughs> if they could get him out of office without having any responsibility for doing so. I mean, that's the, the, the challenge is that if they're viewed as, Hey, they're just a bunch of swamp dwellers under a different name and they pushed this guy out. And then I think they alienate a huge segment of their party. Yeah. And, and and then those guys probably stay home. So, so for Republicans to say this is great, let's jump on the impeachment bandwagon, and then we'll have Pence, and he's a decent guy, and maybe we'll nominate somebody even better, and this will be, you know, what could be better? You know, it's, it's better than the option we've got. I I have trouble seeing how that would play out well politically for them. Yeah, that isn't. I would just also say that isn't to say that. You know, those guys in the Senate don't need to seriously consider what is the right thing to do here. I'm not saying that it should be purely a matter of, hey, if Trump goes, we lose, and, and therefore we're going to keep him, even though that's bad for the country. Like It comes down to everybody to try to do what's right for the country here. Yeah, totally. You got anything else you want to add before we close this out? Oh, I don't know. It's What a... What a crazy time we live in yeah. now. And were you surprised when he became president? Like when uh, the, during the election night when? Oh my, who wasn't? And yeah. and and honestly, I like I, my my son reminds me of this periodically. We, we was talking about some of the early debates, and I I, I sent him a thing just flat out said Don Trump Donald Trump is not going to the Republicans are not going to nominate Donald right. Trump. Just so yeah, I've been kind of surprised at every turn, um, and. Uh, and I and I guess I've continued to be surprised. It's like his inability to function in a mature and dignified way is just. And do you think it's? I can't. I I just can't get over that. Yeah. Do you think it's because he literally does not care? Well, I I would. <laughs> like I think or, he or, takes pleasure out of being like ha ha. I got the presidency and I say and do whatever the hell I want. I do think there's part of that. Yeah. And I think like the, you know, the Trump derangement syndrome. I think that part of me feels like the, oh, here's what, I know how to make their heads explode tomorrow. I'm going to tweet this. Right. I mean, I do think that part of it is just this gleefully malicious, <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm going to push this button. That'll drive him crazy. <laughs> and the thing is, he's really good at that. Yeah. He's really good at that. Yeah. But is that the best quality for a president of the United States to have in right. in dangerous times? Right. I mean, I, hard I, to say. Yeah. Hard I've, to say that it is. I mean, it's really crazy. Like, who would have ever thought that you would have a president in which your number one 
request would be can you just grow up a little bit like can you please like bring some dignity back to this office for crying out loud like yeah. that i mean it yeah. seems like that would be people's number one deal <laughs> yeah because you've always been able to take it for granted before right for like 240 years yeah not entirely but i mean in comparison i yeah. would say anyway yeah all right well thanks for your time it's been interesting always a pleasure joey <laughs>